Tina Koto Kator, Co Leon Salter Aho, no mo hello mai. I'm Leon Salter, postdoctoral fellow at CARE, and welcome to this rescheduled launch of the CARE white paper, what uh, experiences it with COVID-19 among gig workers. I'll just take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking today on the indigenous land of Te Ati Awa that's never been ceded. And thanks so much for joining us today for this, as I said, rescheduled launch and with so much going on in the world at the moment. Um, so just to give you an idea of what's going to happen today, myself and Mohan are going to be presenting the findings from the study, the report of which has recently been published online. We did in-depth interviews with 25 gig workers over 2020 and 2021 on their experiences of gig work and their navigation of precarity during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll just mention that we have, after our presentation, we have three fabulous panelists who are all experts in the area of gig work. <clears throat> Anita Rossentrater from First Union, Labour MP Ibrahim Omar, and independent journalist Rebecca McPhee. They're each going to talk for around five or ten minutes. I'll introduce them properly then. Um, after the after the presentation of our findings of the report, which is going to last about twenty minutes, and then the end at the end, we'll open up the discussion to questions and comments from you guys, from the audience. So keep them coming throughout the presentation. As soon as you think of something, please post it to the Facebook Live comments function and we'll try and address them at the end. Um, so we'll get started on the presentation. Mohan, do you want to start off doing the first few slides? Kia ora koutou. Um, I want to acknowledge um, Tangata Whenua, particularly the people of uh, Rangitane on whose land um, we um, uh, sit as care and uh, that forms the basis of uh, the infrastructure that informs our work. I am Mohan Datta. And what I will do is talk broadly about the framework of the culture-centered approach, and then um, over to you, Leon, to go over the method. Can I have the next screen, please? So the culture-centered approach broadly asks this question, what are, uh, the distribution of communicative resources, both for information and voice at the margins, particularly within the context of um, the neoliberal transformation of uh, various forms of work and the ongoing attacks on uh, processes of collectivization. For the culture-centered approach, the question is, what are the infrastructures available for the voices of um, uh, workers at the margins. We will then go over into the methods and our findings that Leon will present and then wrap up with our recommendations. Next slide, please. So as a theory of emancipatory social change, the culture-centered approach argues that communicative inequalities or inequalities in the distribution of communication resources, both in terms of resources um, of information and resources for voice, are intertwined with structural and material inequalities. Um, in other words, the lack of access to communicative infrastructures for voice among workers at the margins of neoliberal societies globally over the last three decades has shaped the ongoing uh, forms of attack on um, forms of uh, work and workplace practices. Now, culture-centered approach therefore sees voice at the intersections of um, culture, structure, and agency. S briefly, structures are systems of organizing, and within this context, these are systems of organizing of work that set up the rules, the norms, uh, the policies, and practices. Uh, you know, these would be things such as the norms that shape, for instance, the nature of the contract that um, uh, determines um, uh, workplace practices and gig work. Uh, structures would determine uh, access to preventive resources, such as um, uh, COVID-19 preventive resources, masks, um, 
vaccines, their ability to practice physical uh, distancing. Cultures constitute the everyday norms, uh, the belief systems, value systems, and normative practices of communities. And agency is the capacity of those at the margins to enact their everyday decisions through participation in the processes of change. So culture in the culture-centered approach is a site for um, engaging the margins and working alongside the margins to transform and uh, resist oppressive structures and oppressive systems of organizing work. So the ways in which this shapes our method then is uh, that um, the methodological approach foregrounds the voices of those at the margins as the drivers of the sense-making processes. So the bottom-up uh, or the ground-up process of sense-making uh, in this context um, offers us insights into worker-driven uh, solutions and uh, advisory groups that are built with workers at the margins um, shape the processes of sense-making um, within the overarching structure. The culture-centered approach also articulates that the nature of work in the neoliberal economy is constituted at the intersections of the raised, classed, gendered margins of the intersecting forms of um, oppression, extraction, and exploitation that include the interplays of colonialism, uh, capitalism, and the various uh, structures of racism that continue to uh, perpetuate disenfranchisement. So one of the anchoring themes within this work is the recognition that uh, people doing precarious work, um, uh, particularly within the context of this uh, project, are um, often migrants, are often uh, migrants themselves in uh, precarious positions related to their um, uh, visa situations, related to their uh, citizenship. Uh, situations. But also we recognize that um, the sort of precarity that is highlighted in platform-driven gig work flows from and flows in relationship to the nature of precarity that um, uh, has historically been experienced by the margins in the global south. So we see precarity existing in continuity. Um, for instance, much of the other work of care with low-wage, um, hyper-precarious migrant workers and construction industries with domestic workers outlines the ways in which precarity plays out in uh, global networks of profiteering. And therefore, we see platform-based precarity in conversation with uh, those other forms of precarity that form much of the infrastructures of the global south within the context of global flows of uh, neoliberal capitalism. Next slide, please, uh, Leon. So at the heart of the culture-centered approach is the concept of voice and voice infrastructure. And these voice infrastructures becoming the basis for us to make sense of the overarching structures, but also offering us uh, imaginaries, ways of um, uh, thinking through and bringing into practice um, forms of work, forms of organizing that challenge the neoliberal processes of um, exploitation and disenfranchisement. Next slide, please. So the uh, overarching method of the culture-centered approach is uh, driven by four key components. You know, much of this work is ethnographic, shaped by participant observations, immersive participation in conversation with in-depth interviews. We will be presenting today the uh, data emergent from the in-depth interviews. But this exists in conversation with uh, advisory groups. So in this context, it would be advisory groups of workers in the uh, platform economy and working alongside these advisory groups to make sense of the findings, to come up with solutions, to actually then figure out ways of implementing these solutions working through and with uh, uh, stakeholders. In this process, then we engage with a variety of methods such as photo voice, video-based uh, storytelling, generating white papers and policy briefs like this white paper to uh, co-create infrastructures for change. Over to you, Leon. Mohan. Yeah, so I'll just talk about um, the study, how we recruited the participants. We got 25 participants, as I said um, before, um, recruited on Facebook using this poster um, and the interviews were carried out between June 2020 and September 2021. Um, so right from 
after the first lockdown and through the subsequent second lockdowns that happened in Auckland and the second national lockdown. Um, so of the 25 participants, 14 were in drive share. So uh, Uber, X, DD, Ola or Zumi. And the other 11 were delivery drivers. So delivery work for Uber Eats, Delivery Easy and menu log and just quickly to note 14 of the 25 were also so the majority didn't do gig work as their full-time job they did it as their what that one participant re referred to as their side hustle um so working on top of full-time job doing it in the evenings and weekends and on top of a full-time job or study um so the gender balance was 76 percent male and 24% female. I did try and do some sort of purposive sampling to try and get more women gig workers. Um, but in the end, that didn't really work as I'll get on get into later sort of snowball sampling doesn't really work that well with gig workers because they don't really know many of the um, drivers. Um, but also that at that gender balance is actually quite sort of representative of, of other studies that have been done on gig work other recent studies including um the first report that came out last year that anita co-wrote um it is especially delivery and ride share driving it is a male dominated profession um and location, it was a bit heavily, I, I don't know if you can see that that well, but the big sort of chunk there is Wellington, um, mostly because I advertised, um, I initially advertised it on the Vic Deals website, which is a big Wellington Facebook group. And we got a lot of responses from that. And also I was based in Wellington. So maybe Wellington was a little bit overrepresented, but we also had five from Auckland, four in Christchurch and one each in New Plymouth and Hastings. So the interview process, the interviews were all held over Zoom um, in the pandemic environment. That's the, the, the only way you can do it really. They were in depth. So they were lasting between 45 and 90 minutes. And with the kind of care or the culture centered methodology of, 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 try, of deep listening with humility and reflexivity. So try not to impose your own sort of perspectives too much on them trying to listen to them let trying to sort of let them articulate their own um their own issues their own problems with gig work without it without kind of superimposing your own kind of views over that so we kind of sort of started off gently by, by letting them describe their work and then you go into sort of uh, what are the what are the problems with that what are the health problems and then you sort of build up slowly build up to sort of political questions and then how they would what the kind of solutions that they themselves would bring to those to those questions um so results um we found we argue in the report that platform work has these seven key structural features some of them are similar to other kind of work um but a lot of them are quite unique to gig work or platform work um we argue that it's piecemeal, precarious, individualized, gamified, dehumanized, automated, and hyper-competitive. And the result of all these is more like this sort of gagged voiceless woman in the bottom right-hand corner than this kind of idealized model, uh, millennial model that from the Uber zone advertising that's having a great time doing gig work. Um, so firstly, I'll talk about piecemeal and precarious. Um, as you know, probably not gig work is all about supply and demand, right? Because they're not employees of Uber. They're classed as contractors. The driver is paid for each micro transaction. They don't get a wage. Um, so as this driver's articulating, um, it, it's just how many hours you do you get work is just how money you get. So sometimes it's really quiet. Sometimes it's not even worth going out, just turning your car on. It's basically just waiting. So, they, so they're sitting there waiting, waiting around in their cars until they get demand, right? So as I said, classes contractors rather than employees, they receive no sick pay. 
no annual leave or pension. As this driver is pointing out in this second quote, it's the sole responsibility of the individual gig worker themselves to put money aside, to pay for that sick pay, to say pay for that san, uh, annual leave, which of course is extremely difficult at the moment. Um, when you're on less than the minimum wage and with the cost of living going up so much and petrol costs going up and that kind of thing. And so gamified, um, we argue that the, the way that drivers, because they don't have an employee, the way they sort of interact um, with, with, the, with Uber or with the other platforms, is on through the app through on their phones, which is almost kind of like in a similar way to a game, where the drivers are almost competing against the app to try to extract as much money as they can for in as little time as possible, right? But what this means as well that the platforms also play the game, and that because of the um, iniquitous power relationship, they've got a lot more power to shape the game um, the way they want it. So. And that way, the platforms deliberately withhold information, right? Information that is crucial, you think would be crucial for the workers to gauge whether or not to accept the job, making a bit of a mockery of that independent contractor status, which should be based on parties having full access to the terms of engagement before accepting. But as this driver is relating here, they don't find out where the driver is going until they pick them up, which by which time it's too late to cancel the trip. Um, so and that's not saying that the drivers are completely powerless, right? They do have some agency. Um, they And they ended up doing things like signing up to multiple platforms and swapping between them. So having Uber on at the same time as Ola and that kind of thing, and, and then sort of, and what they do, because um, Uber charges a really high commission rate, 28%, so 28 cents of every dollar that they earn goes straight to Uber. Um, so Uber is really hard to make become profitable unless you're, they're, they're doing surge pricing, which I'll get onto in a minute. So often the drivers we spoke to would accept an Uber ride, um, but, but, but as they were on the way there to get to pick up the Uber ride, they'd get another offer from through through Ola, which of course is more profitable. So they'd cancel the Uber trip. So that's a little bit of kind of agency that they had. But then again, sort of Uber then has its own kind of moves. It plays its its chess piece, um, and they sanction them if the cancellation rate gets too high. And they, as well as the stick, they also have this carrot, which is their reward system, Uber Pro which has certain benefits for attaining a 97% <clears throat> acceptance rate, including actually getting to speak to a human being when you, on the phone when you have a dispute or issue. I'll get onto that dehumanized element in a bit. And another aspect of gamification is the algorithmic management, right? Yeah, so no human managers. Control is through algorithmic nudges, like surge pricing. Um, and so surge pricing is basically um, where the uh, Uber deliberately sort of, there's a supply and demand issue. So there's less supply of drivers in a certain locale and more demand from driver, some, from riders, sorry. So they offer sort of two, sometimes three or even four times the normal rate that they get for a non-surge price drive. Um, and it appears on their phones as these kind of heat maps. Um, however, because of, of the aforementioned sort of um, information and power asymmetries, um, often drivers would go, as this driver is talking about here in the quote, they would go to where the, um, wh where the surge pricing should be. And then when it comes through, where the fare comes through on their app, it doesn't come through at that surge price. And of course, because that decision is made by an algorithm, there's no way of contesting it. Um, and yeah, so that gets on to dehumanized and automated, right? Algorithmic management, that form of control that Uber has over its drivers means they're also 
allows them to have a sort of dehumanize a lack of human presence in New Zealand and the other countries that it's located what the um, what Graham here a, a geographer talks about as being they're simultaneously embedded and disembedded in the locations from which they extract profit so they're embedded in terms of um, their sort of market dominance and their control over the driver's incomes and behaviors through algorithmic management and through their vast kind of our data capture which enables <coughs> artificial intelligence but they remain kind of physically disembedded um, in terms of kind of actually humans on the ground right they used to have these green hubs for dri where drivers could go and actually talk to human beings and hang out with other drivers. But I think when the pandemic started, they got rid of those. And that also contributes to the sort of power imbalances because as this driver notes, when there's no human component to, um, to, the, to the company, there's no human to question, right? There's just an algorithm and an algorithm can't really give you answers there's no because there's no human component to it there's no one to question right and there's no there's unless you join the uber pro there's not even a human being you can speak to on the phone right they get they get chat bots when they are uh, giving them a, a sort of generic answers when they try and resolve a query so a lot of them just give up but like they don't bother ever sort of trying to resolve a query with Uber. And the lack of human presence contributes to the feelings of isolation for the drivers who work in their own private cars with no staff rooms to chew the fat with other drivers. Many of the drivers I spoke to didn't know any other drivers. And what I was talking about, so it made sort of the snowball method of recruitment difficult. And while there's some sort of interaction and sense of common interest generated in the Facebook groups, as a lot of drivers noted, those are kind of, you, you get a lot of kind of trolls on those and they're kind of individual, they're still, uh, and social media is overridden by this kind of individualizing and competitivizing logics of that platform. And so that kind of generates, further embeds the kind of sense that they're competing against each other rather than colleagues. Um, drivers are forced to become these kind of micro entrepreneurs to survive where the, you, you, you get a competitive edge by getting more information than your competitors, right? And so the second part of our report talks about the, the implications of all this for collective organizing, right? And the power imbalances and the lack of transparent disciplinary processes together with the feelings of isolation create this general kind of fear of speaking out in the drivers and there have been actual real cases in the us uk and australia when drivers have suddenly kind of found that their algorithm has been tweaked and they suddenly find it really hard to get rides after speaking out and they even sometimes get activated altogether from the app and actually, Uber actually includes non-disclosure and non-disparagement clauses in their contracts, contributing to the sense of fear that drivers will be punished for speaking out. Uh, this made recruitment quite slow and difficult, as I said. And, and as mentioned, the drivers are very isolated from each other with no way for them to contact each other or physical places for, to meet up. This driver here in this quote, quite a long quote, sorry, it's um, the taxi drivers know each other well enough, but that they're sort of done their own thing, but Uber drivers don't really get any way to contact each other. So I think there definitely needs to be a thing to bring these drivers together because a lot of them are getting screwed over in the same way. So they don't realize that. I think they do need a union of some sort, but the thing is that Uber, because everyone's contractors and everyone is working from home, people who have no idea who another Uber driver is. Uh, and so this driver is kind of articulating how it's particularly crucial for Uber drivers to become unionized because of their isolation from each other. So they need somehow to come together to create a kind of collective voice 
because they don't have other ways of coming together and 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 finding common interests but at the same time there's barriers to organizing and, and mobilizing because as those as i said there's no there's no physical locations for those collective interests to sort of form or for unions to go there's no staff rooms for unions to go in and recruit drivers and and because they're contractors and anita's better on the sort of um on the law around this but strikes and collective bargaining are actually illegal for contractors and because the competition between workers that i talked about it makes even stop work events some of them have been attempted but they, those are quite difficult because some drivers who don't work on a certain day means there's more likely to be surge pricing as i covered um, on a previous slide so that impedes solidarity because the less drivers that are working because of a stop work day the more likely it's it's going to be profitable for the other drivers that aren't working that aren't taking part in the action right um so that one organization that did successfully organize a stop work day here in Aotearoa in 2018 was the rideshare drivers network um they were established in 2017 the group was made up of drivers and also they got some good media coverage and opened up lines of dialogue with government but because of the unsustainable nature of gig work the group kind of found it hard to get drivers to come to meetings and and also the key actors then found more secure employment so it's kind of the group's kind of dissipated since then and so lastly implications for health and well-being of all this um in particularly in the in the pandemic environment right so earnings that for drivers that we spoke to decreased dramatically for rideshare drivers after the after during and after the lockdowns um in this quote this driver is detailing how their um their earnings went down from sort of roughly around minimum wage a little bit less twenty dollars an hour but before expenses of course but after covid they think they they're earning about half of that so ten dollars an hour before expenses and demand while well, demand increased for the delivery drivers of course delivering food during the pandemic that's a lot of them still didn't did, didn't say they that their earnings still increased that much even though they were earning more they said things like the restaurants couldn't cope with the demands so um they even though they're working more they weren't necessarily earning that much more and because of the whole independent contractor status of uber drivers and delivery drivers they had very little protection from covid and they have very little ongoing protection from covid no masks or sanitizer provided which are very difficult to get in the first lockdown uber did offer a 20 dollars refund for sanitizer but actually they rarely paid this out um, you had to go through this got long drawn out application process which um often ended up like they've just refused it for for silly reasons and it's not worth the driver's time to apply for it um then of course didn't get any face-to-face -face training <clears throat> on on how to do their jobs during a pandemic to re reduce their risk instructions were all sent by email or they were had videos to watch um and of course, ride rideshare drivers, rideshare companies, the platforms have also re refused to impose vaccine vaccine mandates on drivers. And rideshare involves, of course, being closely confined confined um, in a in a car with, you know, you're very close to a group of strangers, up to four strangers in a closed environment of a car, which is a highly contagious environment, right? And and some of them some of the drivers <coughs> of course in this kind of highly polarized environment that we're in some of the drivers did sort of pick up people um, that refused to wear masks and <coughs> um 
and, and because of the kind of customer or is always right ethos they felt like they couldn't really cancel the job because of like the people coming in um not wearing masks so they would just kind of get on with it anyway and their lack of protections that i mentioned no sick pay or other protections means that they're likely to work while symptomatic right probably avoiding getting a test if they're symptomatic because thinking oh this um, they, they're, they're basically going to earn no money for their families if they if, if if they go off work um showing some quite deep inequalities in the government's response to Omicron there. And I haven't talked as, as much about the delivery drivers as much as the ride share, uh, but this driver is talking about how kind of, while delivery drivers, sh delivery driving should be contactless or food delivery should be contactless. In reality, that kind of idea of, of contactless delivery doesn't quite work in reality. This driver's talking about how it should be contactless, but when I go to a restaurant, there's going to be half the time contact. People are sociable. They hand me the bag. I don't care. I'm just going to take it. It's a compounding risk. Get the business level and the customer's hungry. They've waited at level three. You know, they're going to look at these delays because through every order, I'm going, wow, it's been half an hour. The cold, food's getting cold. People are getting hungry and impatient. People, when I arrive, they just want to grab the food and eat. Um, and delivery drivers, <clears throat> of course, are performing, have performed and are performing an essential service during lockdown. <clears throat> and people isolating at the moment who need food, right? But while they're doing that, they could be putting themselves and others at risk. So conclusions, the nature of platform work, those seven structural features I mentioned create those piecemeal and precarious working conditions um, that put drivers and others at risk. There's real bad implications for collective bargaining with this model because there's no bargaining rights. There's, it's difficult for them to join or even impossible for them to join unions or form collective interests. They're isolated and individualized. And the implications for health and well-being, there's no financial protections. They're at risk of contracting and transmitting COVID. <clears throat> and there's an absence of communicative infrastructures for worker voice to let the sort of public know um, about what's happening. Like we, we just don't hear about this kind of stuff in the media. Uh, workers don't know who to go to, where to seek resources, and they just, they just don't have any kind of space for formulating and voicing their demands. So we have some recommendations. And these are based on um, the interviews. They're based in the voices of the workers themselves. Some kind of compensation for precarity. Um, they don't have that job security. Um, some kind of additional levy to compensate for their precarity. Research has shown contractors are usually kind of 25 to 30 percent worse off than employees when taking into account leave, pension, tax, etc. This levy would allow them to save during those periods of high demand, so they're covered by periods of low demand. Other drivers wanted a minimum hourly rate, which matches the minimum wage. Um, the platform should ensure that drivers receive a minimum hourly rate. And that's from the point that they log on to the app to the point they log off. So not just the time that they're driving with a customer in the car, right? It's all the waiting time and the time between jobs. Algorithmic transparency. A lot of drivers complained about the unfairness of decisions being made by algorithms. Uh, with no sort of human to complain to. So we argue that decisions made by algorithms should be clearly explained to workers and that they should have some right to appeal. Um, and they should have the option of becoming an, an employer. A lot of the drivers, they didn't, when I asked them if they wanted to become employees, when me and Mohan asked them, 
they a lot of them didn't want to become employees um which for a lot of different reasons they like the sort of flexibility of gig work and they kind of kind of like sold on the whole ideology of the the freedom and coolness of the gig economy um so giving them the option of becoming an employee after three months is an option so some of them that do and also there's a diff big difference between those that do the job full-time and those that do it part-time a lot of them that have do the job part-time on top of another job wouldn't want to be uh, necessarily be classed as employees of uber and uber's got this kind of reputation of being a horrible company that they don't really want to be employees of as well so if we give them the option of becoming an employee after three months and also set basic employment rights for gig workers those that re want to remain as contractors enjoy basic employment rights such as annual leave sick pay and pensions um that would get around that and then uh, co-create voice infrastructures with them it's got to be sort of bottom-up worker-led worker-owned advisory groups where diverse voices are at at the margins of the margins share experiences because they don't have those spaces for sharing their experiences and building their own strategies for transformation um, people by the gig workers themselves this group would establish an infrastructure for the articulation of their voices in wider society which doesn't exist at the moment and act as that collective space for organizing and and that group would also sort of attend to the margins of the margins, the colonial race class, citizenship based formations of gig work that should drive the organizing for transformation. So that's that's it. Mohan, did you want to come in and add some add some summarizing points before we go to the panelists? Yes, uh, Leon, thank you so much for presenting this. Um, I just wanted to add uh, three meta points about um, the, the key themes. One is what we see throughout the organizing of gig work and that shapes the kinds of structural uh, conditions that you talk about is the nature of communicative inequality. That communicative inequality is built into the platforms with really the platform infrastructure itself being invisible, if you will, um, in terms of um, that theme of workers not knowing whom to go to, where to go to, to seek resources. So, you know, one of the uh, consistent narratives was um, uh, the gig workers talking about, you know, if they needed preventive resources, say um, the masks, or if they, once they paid for the sanitizer and they wanted to be reimbursed, uh, they turned uh, the materials in and then say they didn't get reimbursed, they didn't know where to go to because Uber doesn't have a physical infrastructure here. So part of the communicative inequality is in the nature of the, um, uh, of the infrastructure of platform capital that can operate across global spaces without a physical infrastructure to hold it accountable which then you know connects to my next point uh, related to labor rights and labor laws so then the question is that what kind of labor laws need to be put into place to hold platform capital um, accountable uh, and to actually um, a subject platform capital that doesn't have physical infrastructure in the country to um, the, the labor context of the uh, space or of the country and the final point I wanted to uh, make, Leon, is uh, uh, related to the migrant context, the raised uh, context of um, um, the gig work. So even though we did not collect uh, that piece of uh, demographic information, most of the workers I was interviewing were um, uh, migrant um, uh, gig workers. And um, that brings in the precarity of gig work in the backdrop of the gig of the precarity of being a uh, migrant so sort of you know the big picture question then for us i think is in terms of the future of work if platform capital is going to be the future of work if ai based work is going to be the future of work uh, these communicative um, inequalities need to be addressed in innovative ways uh, particularly with uh, platform corporations that do not have uh, 
physical um, infrastructures within uh, the space of the uh, country. Thank you. Great. Should, should we bring in the panelists? And Anita, did you want to speak first? Did you want to um, respond to um, <clears throat> our findings, our recommendations, drawing on your own research and your own sort of experiences with gig work, organizing gig workers? Sorry, can we? She's, is she on mute? So I should probably Sorry, introduce. <laughs> I should probably introduce you first as well as you're the um, strategic project coordinator for transport logistics and manufacturing at First Union, <clears throat> leading the campaign for real work, real jobs. And you've been involved in sort of organizing gig workers and getting them to join first um, with a sort of different sort of um, non kind of fee paying model, haven't you? Which is quite innovative and uh, and you've also been organizing some meetings with gig workers with uber drivers recently you know, and you've also got that um you've also got that court case going through at the moment so yeah which is doing some great stuff sorry i'll let uh, you go thanks leon yeah that's a really comprehensive introduction thank mm. you um yeah so just to reiter reiterate i'm anita from first union um, and we're a large private sector union with a union for transport workers in New Zealand. So that's, um, I guess, the connection here because um, as it stands, most gig workers in New Zealand are working in the transport industry in terms of uh, rideshare driving and, and food delivery driving and that kind of thing. Um, and like Leon mentioned, given the current uh, classification of these workers as um, contractors, they don't technically have a right to unionize or collectively bargain their wages and conditions, um, which makes it a little bit more difficult, more complicated for us to organize them. Um, so we're doing what we can, uh, given those being the circumstances. Um, and yeah, what that looks like is um, kind of doing our best to sort of create a network of these workers and um, assist them to, um, you know, fight for, for their rights by way of a, a whole range of different activities, um, including, like Leon mentioned, um, taking a case to the employment court later this year on their behalf, um, where they are seeking, a group of them are seeking a declaration that they are in fact employees of Uber, um, not independent contractors. So we're, we have really high hopes that um, we'll be, be successful um, in that fight. And yeah, um, I'm first and foremost, um, you know, I think the research is a very important um, contribution to this conversation. And um, as it's mentioned, there's very little information about these workers in our country and around the world um, at the moment. Um, there was obviously even little prior to this research being conducted. Uh, First Union, we also did some research in the last few years. And so um, we've kind of collectively sort of got the ball rolling in this area, which is really positive because I think it will trigger further research by other interested parties. Um, and I think that, you know, it's a kind of widely held view that um, given how, um, you know, the particularly difficult circumstances of these workers, that it's really important that this, this work is done, that, um, you know, their plight is highlighted and the issues that they experience are um, brought to the fore. Um, they don't have the right to unionize like other workers do so they can't it's limited you know in terms of them being able to do that themselves um in that more traditional way um and i think the care report you know it does a really good job of sort of deep diving into what the structural issues are of this work and then some of the more kind of real life re real life impacts on workers um how it sort of plays out and it's kind of a uniquely frustrating form of work to be involved in um by all accounts um, and um, I just wanted to touch on the fact that um, the key structural features that have been identified in the report, um, that this is really important and, um, you know, maybe to those of us who are kind of like involved at this high level sort of academic um, side of things, but I think just kind of like being able to say that, you know, what characterizes this work is that it's piecemeal, it's precarious, it's individualized, it's gamified, it's dehumanized, automated and highly competitive is extremely important because it kind of just gives us 
this sort of structure to talk about this work and then a lot of the quite unique issues experienced by these workers fall out of those um, more sort of broad structural ideas. Um, so, you know, in terms of some of the, the really, um, yeah, those, like I said, those kind of unique frustrations that these workers have, I mean, those of us who are not currently managed by an app or an algorithm just can't imagine how incredibly frustrating this is. Um, you know, there's just, there's no, there's no human at the other end of that. Um, it's all being programmed to happen without the need for there to be humans involved in, in that part of the process. Um, and that makes it extremely difficult for these workers to feel like they have any control over the way their workday um, unfolds. And the lack of transparency over that as well um, means that, you know, you have situations where I had, I had a meeting with a driver a couple of weeks ago um, and he had done this incredible job of um, over many years of driving and recording what he had been paid for what work and that kind of thing. Um, he had created a breakdown of how the fee structure works for Uber and um, it's highly complicated, you know, it's not like for most workers where you know that you're going to receive, you know, an hour, hourly wage of yay amount and then you might have sort of some other payments on top of that um, and it's all in black and white in your employment agreement or in the legislation um, and, you know, on top of that you have access to a union so if ever you're not quite sure that you're receiving the right thing you can get professional advice on that. Um, for these workers it takes, it takes years of kind of like working back trial and error to figure out how their pay is actually calculated um, and certainly can't argue that that means that they have any control over their pay and so their um, status as contractors really is um, you know completely false. Um, I think it's important that the report sort of talks about the nature of the flexibility that we sort of hear so much about with regard to gig work, this idea that um, it's a major benefit to these workers to have this sort of flexibility in terms of their start and finish times. Um, and it's a bit of a misconception, I suppose, that in employment you can't have that. Uh, in fact, many employees do have flexibility around their start and finish times. Um, and that is something that um, I think Uber has worked really hard over the years to kind of perpetuate this myth that that's something that they just would lose, potentially lose if they became employees. Um, the lack of health and safety is obviously really concerning when it comes to this work. Um, these companies take absolutely no responsibility for the health and safety of their workers. And this is despite the fact that New Zealand's um, health and safety um, legislation was actually overhauled a few years ago. Um, you know, some of you were, will already know this, that um, one of the results of the Royal Commission into Pike River Mine disaster was that... Um, we needed to remove the distinction between contractors and employees in our health and safety legislation because what it resulted in was employers um, observing their duties and obligations with regard to keeping employees safe and then not taking any of the same um, precautions for contractors and that was um, you know that resulted in um, you know it, a lot of terrible um, accidents and the loss of many lives so, um, you know, in our view, uh, we would certainly see that these platform companies are PCBUs um, under the current health and safety legislation. And so we don't agree that they should be completely avoiding their responsibilities. Um, but due to the sort of complicated nature of the way that they engage these workers and sort of denial of their responsibilities um, as employers of these workers, it's much easier for them to just continue um, to avoid that kind of responsibility as well. So really fantastic and important work highlighting a lot of those issues through the report. Um, where it sort of sticks for me, and I've talked um, to Leon at length about this, is that we're, we have a little bit of a different view when it comes to the recommendations. Um, you know, in my view, the issues identified in the report could be largely remedied by making um, these workers employees rather than contractors. It sort of sounds like a relatively um, simple solution, which means that, um, the recommendations as they stand in my view are probably unnecessarily complicated. Um, what they sort of do in combination I guess is they equate to a sort of in-between category or a third category as it's often referred to um, and that means that um, 
these workers would sort of still be in a position where they have um, some substandard rights and um, benefits as compared to most other workers in the country. There's sort of this implication that maybe it's a middle ground between where the platforms see things and where the workers see things. Um, but we kind of are of the view that these workers should have full um, employment rights and benefits and that they shouldn't, that there's sort of no real um, reason, um, convincing reason in our view for them to only receive um, a con sort of concessionary package of those things. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this, this, there is a, some misconceptions um, out there about what employment would mean for those, these workers. And so I totally don't blame them that some of them um, when, asked, when asked the question, you know, do you want to be an employee that they, they would answer no. Um, like I said, the, the flexibility question, there's a, a lot of misinformation out there about what that would mean. The other major one is that um, they're sometimes uh, of the view that they wouldn't be able to work for multiple platforms if they were employees of any given platform. Um, that's false as well. So our employment laws um, do allow workers to hold more than um, hold employment with more than one employer. And we actually had a, um, a change to our laws in recent years specifically to allow for secondary employment and to prevent employers from imposing unreasonable um, restrictions on that. And that came out of a um, really important fight in the union movement here um, around zero hours contracts. I'm sure that some of you will remember that as well. Um, so the other thing is that um, I guess that when I've spoken to workers before about kind of what they think would fix their situation, um, you know, we sort of have this tendency to self-moderate. We sort of like think of what would be like the easiest fix or fix or um, maybe um, we kind of, you know, we almost bargain ourselves down before we're even up against um, the employer in that regard. regard. And I, I think Kiwis in particular, we don't want to ask for the world, you know, we want to ask for something that we think is reasonable. Um, and one of the really illuminating things that came out of First Union's own research in recent years is that when we ask the question, um, you know, what would what would prevent you from doing something about a workplace issue, the most common answer um, selected by 63% of participants was feeling like nothing would change anyway. Um, and the next most common answers after that were um, in this order, not having the money to seek professional advice um, fear of being fired or otherwise disadvantaged by the company, a lack of time, uh, not knowing how to go about doing it, not wanting to rock the boat. Um, so it's pretty clear that um, workers have been made to feel over, you know, decades um, of being worn down by employers that um, that they can't change their lot, that they don't have any influence over their lot. So um, that's the, sort of the first um major reaction, I suppose, um, around just wanting these workers to, to receive full benefits of employment rather than partial. Um, and then the other side of that is that um, we, I guess we have concerns about the effect of introducing effectively a sort of third category um, and the impact that that might have on the rest of the work workforce as well in terms of having a bit of like a dragging effect on wages and conditions. So it's quite difficult to maintain good standards for all workers um, when you have some workers who are sort of receiving even less um, than what most workers are. And then um, there's always that fear that, you know, um, if I kick up a fuss about what I currently have, I could end up in an even worse position than I am now. So, yeah, some of those kind of things that um, we have to think about, I suppose. I totally respect the um, methodology used by CARE, by the way. I mean, I think it's really fantastic that the, the research done, um, you know, that this this really strong sort of grounding and the voices of, of participants. Um, and I myself like to operate like that, you know, I'm working for a union, I'm being paid by workers. Um, our union is democratically led. So um, what we do is at the direction of workers. Um, and I've had the um, major privilege of being, you know, funded through doing this job over many years to develop um, a really sort of nuanced understanding of these kinds of things. And so I kind of consider it my, my duty, I suppose, to kind of um, use that to, to communicate to, to workers um, about the kind of wider ramifications that they themselves 
might not necessarily be able to um, fully kind of get from their from their perspective working 50 hours a week you know trying to put food on the table for their families so yeah um, I guess um, in in um, conclusion because I've probably talked for a bit too long now <laughs> is that um, the work is incredibly important and I and I commend um, Mohan and Leon and co for what they've done um, for bringing these issues to the fore and highlighting what these workers are experiencing. And I just hold out a lot of hope that, um, you know, those of us who are really interested in advocating for these workers um, and the workers themselves can obviously achieve really good outcomes over the, ne the next few years. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. That was really great. Yeah, some really great points there, and uh, which we can come back, come back to later, hopefully, if we have time. But yeah, that's an important point of putting gig work in the context, in the wider context, isn't it? Of other kind of, it's not like gig work is the only kind of precarious, kind of crappy work out there, is there? So any changes that happen are going to have effects on the wider uh, work context in New Zealand, aren't they? <clears throat> Ibrahim, do you want to come in next? <clears throat> I'll just give you a, I'll give you a proper introduction. Um, Ibrahim's a, a Labour list MP. He became an MP to represent communities like gig workers who struggle to have their voices heard. Um, and you, you came to New Zealand um, as a refugee from Eritrea. Is that right? Um, and then you kind of became a minimum wage cleaner graduating from university, became a, a union organiser and now now an MP. And you've also got lots of um, people working in gig work, like Uber drivers in your community, but you're also privy to government discussions about what, what kind of things can be done in this space. So I'd love to have your opinion on, on, the, on, the, on that whole kind of whether we introduce that kind of middle worker category or, or, or whether we should just, everyone should be employers and uh, employees and, and other other things that you thought about the report yeah. uh, um, th thank you um leon for that kind um introduction um can i first acknowledge you and 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 the mohan and and those who work with you and, and putting this really uh good uh, piece of um paper together on highlighting the issues of uh, and some of the most disadvantaged uh, workforce, I should say. Um, and to me, th this is really personal because a lot of people from my um, community are, are involved and engaged in this in this work. And 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 day to day, um, I, and I know and I see what they go through. And um, it really is to me um, and something close close to my heart. And um, can I also acknowledge? Um, my other co-panelist um, is um, Anita, who's, who's a good friend and, and also I happen to work with um, both when, when we both work for E2 and also um, Rebecca. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm going to kick off this with, uh, uh, with some of the remarks that Anita um, made. I think I, I uh, entirely agree with um, um, her remarks around that the, the, I think the, the driver should have the full um, employment rights. And, and, and now um, I see um, everyday people tell me that, that it, it's, it gives them um, flexibility. Um, it, it's, they are some sort of um, independence. I think that's because they also don't know what they're missing. And that they also don't know that how much uh, they're being um, taking um, taking their uh, advantage of, and the reason why I say this is is is, is because uh, and, and remember a lot of these drivers are refugees and, and, and the migrants and they come from uh, backgrounds where you don't you don't speak up for your rights and definitely for your employment rights. Otherwise, you would be gone, you'd be fired, and then you would never get a job again. Uh, so the, they come with the same mindset and then they tend to just um, shut up and, and get, get on with things. Um, and also a lot of a lot of drivers that who say that this is um, uh, it gives them some sort of sense of uh, independence and, and um, flexibility are people that who do uh, overdrive overdriving other use overdriving at the secondary job and they would have a job daytime and then um, afternoon basically they can go and do a few hours where they can uh, make up few more money 
but uh, if you ask and explain to most of the drivers who entirely depend on this work, and they will tell you that that uh, if they can get uh, this right, and, and of course they want to be an employees, and they want to have a full employment rights. And, and I remember many of these migrants and refugees, they want to go back and see their families. And the many of them can't simply because they can't afford it. Um, they don't have an annual leave. Uh, and once they uh, they stop driving, there is no more income for them. And this, this is just as simple as that. Um, in terms of the precariousness of the work, I think you guys have mentioned it. Um, um, uh, uh, you covered this really, really well. But I just want to touch on, on what was really happening during the COVID-19. Um, uh, well, starting from uh, March 2020 and then up to up to now, up to the current um, 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 outbreak, um, a lot of a lot of drivers um, are uh, Uber argue that the, the, these drivers are um, they are um, self-employed, they are contractors, um, and 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 yet they don't have any. Um, um rights that that self-employed people or businesses have for example they if someone um is jumping on their on their taxi and and was out they can't ask the vaccination status of this person and if they do um they get disciplined i've got quite a few stories really to share with them because i thought that would be a, a good way to highlight the, the issue or what the drivers go through um, um i can't even mention their name because lately i've had a a pleasure of working with E2 and um, in, in, in organizing these drivers um, and, uh, and getting listening listening to their stories. And a lot of, um, um, Anita said that a lot of uh, drivers are, can't, they can't really challenge this because um, uh, because the consequence will be worse off for them. And, uh, and, and, and she's right. And the peop- these drivers are even terrified to open their mouths when I told, when I shared the story of the the court case, and a lot of them basically pushed back and they said we're going to be targeted. Um, once our um, uh, 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 accounts are deactivated, we don't even know. We don't have anyone to talk to. There is no the human human interaction. So um, we we know we can't talk to the app. We can't talk to the computer, and no one is going to listen to our pain. So please leave us alone because we are at least we've got an income. And and after weeks and weeks and weeks of um, um, conversations with them, we managed to restore their faith and the confidence. And now many of them are being involved, sharing their stories, and that they are even going to be uh, put their names on the on the court case as well. So that's a progress that we have made in the last two three months. So um, Mioli was was um, uh, Mioli is an, an Uber driver, and he basically cautioned um, a, a passenger. Um, for why are you not putting the mask on? And, and, and you know, like you've got to follow the rules like the, all, all of us. And the driver ended up making um, a, a complaint to Uber. Uber disciplined him by activating his account um, uh, temporarily. And it took um, Peter Crane to actually get involved and, and write to Uber and for Uber to turn around and activate his account. Um, Ma... Um, was Ma received um, um, a message from Uber and the saying that uh, the, the, he has he got he he's some sort of been um, he compromised the public health and when he when when he asked Uber and they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't explain things so he had to contact public health who said that they do, we don't have any problem we didn't make any 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 uh, any uh, complaint against you. And his account already was suspended by this time, and and it, it it has taken a lot of messages to Uber Uber to Uber to get back to him and said we're gonna send you someone to um to to support you, which they didn't do. Um, two weeks later, and they all of a the sudden they activated his account, and Ma ended up um, losing two weeks of income. Imagine for two weeks not being able to have any sort of income. And and this is a family man with with, with kids and uh, and other commitments and stuff. So um, and and also during the the, the, the pandemic, um, there was no work. Obviously, when everyone stayed home and and Uber drivers didn't have any income, and Uber did not step up to help these people. Um, 
and we know that how much Uber make this, uh, how much make uh, Uber uh, make uh, the amount of money Uber make from from these people, right? They charge twenty eight percent of their income. If they make hundred dollar in three four hours or even five hours, twenty eight dollar directly goes to Uber. And on top of that, all the expenses. There is a petrol. There is a car maintenance. There is tires. There is is so many things. And by the time they pay off this thing, these people are actually worse off. They don't even make a minimum wage. And when you explain this thing, that's when they actually understand, well, you know, we make a money, a good money, and then no wonder by the end of the month we don't have any money in our accounts because they, sometimes they, they just don't understand. And the John was during the, the, la, the latest. So I'll just go back to the point that I made earlier. Um, when we were on lockdown, they didn't have any income. Uber didn't step up, obviously. They got some support from, from MB, um, $600 per week, and that's not even um, even minimum wage. So and then again, and these people were so throughout the lockdown, throughout all this uh, Uber period. Obviously, there were times where um, we were out of lockdowns and things were moving a little bit, and they were making some money, but it's not enough. For the last two years, these people severely um, suffered. I'm saying this because people talk to me every day, every night I talk to people and they share their stories with me. And uh, and John, during the, the parliament um, protests at parliament, John picked up a couple of people uh, from, uh, from airport. He asked them to put the mask on and they told him to F off and we'll knock you out. And they made all these threats and to the point that he, he, were, he were terrified for, for his life. He took um, about two, three days of work. He contacted Uber. There was no answer. Um, Alice uh, is, is paranoid for her own health. And she asked people to put masks on, and she gets a lot of abuse. She tried to talk to Uber. There is no answer. So not only their income and the economically disadvantaged, this people has, uh, this people's well-being and, and health is, is severely compromised. And, um, and 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 yet Uber is not uh, stepping up to do to do um, to do anything about it. So I suppose um, uh, and, and hopefully the, the court case and the way and and also this paper that's coming out is hopefully going to open a lot of eyes. Um, a lot of people are going to take notes of of we've got uh, thousands of our people who are being uh, disadvantaged by the by the company that um, doesn't even pay tax in our country, in our shores. And I think it's that explains really uh, everything what Uber is about. And we have seen the other kind of places where court cases have been um, taken against Uber. Things actually uh, got better for a lot of drivers. So there is no reason why that can happen here in New Zealand. So um, uh, I think uh, everything has been covered, uh, really. Uh, it's only going to go back and be a reputation if I, uh, if I say that the same thing that the Leon and, and the Mohan uh, covered in their reports and also uh, 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 Anita. I think it's about time that, that um, uh, these drivers get organized. There are unions that, who are working on this space. A2 and, and, um, and, and the first union are uh, taking care of this. And I think they would be two fantastic unions to organize Uber drivers and to be to be their voice. Otherwise, I don't see any other way. I don't see any other way these people's lives are improving. Even if we end up winning a court case tomorrow, things um, improve in terms of the employment rights. If they are not organized, um, if they don't speak collectively for themselves, and nothing is going to, um, Uber probably is going to come back with some other majors and excuses to make their lives um, worse. And, and now I have seen um, at the beginning, I remember a lot of excitement that people felt when Uber started here in New Zealand and how much money they were making. Obviously, Uber to attract people, they were uh, giving some incentives. For example, I remember giving them like tonight, whether you make money or not, if you uh, open your account and if you start your car, be on the street, we're going to pay you $40, for example, per hour for eight hours. And, and that's because there's a lot of that could be the all blacks games, for example, and they know that Uber at the back of that they were gonna make a lot of money, and that obviously once they have enough drivers, they stop those things, and they don't offer any incentives now, and we've been people's lives um, uh, being compromised, their well-being, 
um, their lives being at risk. We haven't said any responsibility from Uber um, stepping up, at least even sending them a message of like, um, you know, like expressing um, concern for them. So um, to me, I'm going to go back to the point that Anita made and I would reiterate that I think the baseline should be these people should have a full employment rights. We're talking about people who are severely disadvantaged. There is a lot of language barrier. There is a lack of understanding about the employ basic needs on employment rights. Many people, many of these people have, people have been around in New Zealand for a long time, but, but, but just because they don't read, they don't know the employment rights, um, they don't understand anything about what's happening around them. And I know people, their accounts have been deactivated for a long time because of the language barrier and the misunderstanding Uber can close their accounts forever and they have to go back to the cleaning and the stuff. So about time that this is something, um, there's something is done about this. And I just want to um, go back and say uh, thank you, um, Leon uh, and, and the Mohan and the team that who worked um, tirelessly with you to uh, put this uh, uh, together. I do believe that this is going to open a lot of a lot of eyes. Can I also mention that the our select committee, the Education and Workforce Select Committee, has launched an um, uh, inquiry into migrant exploitation because I think this also uh, is part of exploitation and a lot of Uber drivers are collectively um, uh, um, has uh, submitted and they are gonna come and, and submit oral as well. So I suggest that if you have a time when, when the oral submissions are open, you tune in, you tune in and, and listen to what they have to say because I think that's going to give you a lot of, a lot of perspectives as well. So again, um, thank you for putting this together and um, uh, so much thanks so much Ibrahim that's some really great points yeah and and so important to sort of yeah bring forth those voices from your community those migrant voices from your community yeah there's that real kind of two we got that from the interviews there's that real two tiers within uber driving at that those and, and when you talked about the language barriers that's that's so important that yeah we got the the people that were born in new zealand and that don't have those language barriers have have got that real competitive advantage straight away and can make the most of those opportunities where yeah as you said that yeah those sort of migrants that and also the people that, yeah that come from maybe like countries that don't have that kind of democratic tradition um and w one of the drivers that i spoke to one of the immigrant drivers compared uber to the taliban the way they they deal with people kind of ingrains that kind of <laughs> anti-democratic kind of authoritarian you pick it up from your uh, characterization of the, the uber drivers is you you pick it up a lot of terms but i think to me dehumanization really stood out and and mm -hmm. the way that uber dehumanized these people is, is it just beyond me and we are, for God's sake, living in New Zealand. And this is not, if this was happening in a place like Eritrea, where I came from, absolutely fine. But here where we have very advanced employment laws and rights, it shouldn't have a place. That's right. Yeah, so the same sort of conditions that have been going on in the global south for a long time are now coming into, yeah, the glo global north and western countries, yeah. Um, yeah, Rebecca, do you want to go next? Um, so Rebecca McPhee's um, an independent journalist uh, and she, she, an award-winning journalist with a background in work, workplace health and safety, business and climate writing. Um, you've written some great books about Pike River, Helen Kelly, and you've also had a recent kind of a great investigative piece come out in North Mag in South Magazine about bad jobs, which kind of where you interviewed gig workers, but also put it in the context of wider kind of landscape of pre precarious work that kind of goes against the whole narrative that at the moment it's a it's a seller's market for for employees and um, everything's rosy. Eh? Yes. Yeah, so do you want to cut? Yeah, thanks, Leon. Um, Tina Koto. Um, I'm probably at risk of uh, repeating a lot of what um, others have said, so I'll probably try and keep it fairly brief to a few key points that have sort of bubbled up um, 
for me, as I've been listening and, and thinking about the paper, but just a couple of things. Firstly, I think it's a, a really an excellent piece of work. Uh, so impressed with it. Um, and so thank you, um, Leon, and your your centre for for doing this work. And of course, um, I guess as a journalist, we do voice centred research all the time. It's called interviewing, and it's central to our craft. And I'm delighted to see that um, uh, an academic discipline embracing that um, language really matters a lot in confronting um, inequitable situations. And I think that you've done a great job here, as Anita has already said, in, I guess, giving us words, um, helping to crystallise um, a phenomena, an economic phenomena, and, and giving it words that we can use to describe that. So I really liked, you know, I grabbed on when I was reading to words like gamified, the dehumanization of it. When I've talked to Uber drivers, um, I know instantly what, what it is you're talking about. So um, they're paying this 20, 28% levy, uh, but they can't get a person on the phone to sort out a problem. They can't, they've, they find themselves uh, blocked. They don't know why. They're left speculating, they're guessing. So I've been astonished in, and this is a new area for me, it's really was um, First Union's survey about a year ago was when I first began really sort of seriously thinking about this as an issue. Um, but I have been astonished at what I've learned about the, the terms on which um, gig workers work and, and with Uber being the sort of the, the exemplar of it. Um, and I think that, you know, that the detail matters a lot too. I think that as the story increasingly comes out, as we put words on it, as we, we you know, as the story is, is shaped, if you like, um, and you, you have to kind of see the public as, as an ally and the way you do that is to tell these stories, the stories that are in the report and the stories that Ibrahim and, and Anita have been talking about as well. I mean, I remember myself discovering for the first time, and it was really only through working um, with some of the material that uh, First Union had done and also the the court papers um, sitting behind the, the action against Uber, that, that, that drivers don't know uh, where the ride is, they have to they have to accept the ride before they find out how far it is, and then once they're they're in, they they take a great risk in cancelling if it's you know a, a little ride that's just around the block that's not worth their while. I, that to me, I remember discovering that in in reading the court documents and um, and in the affidavits. And thinking there is there's no fact that I've learned so far that speaks of powerlessness more than that. And it completely and utterly, I think, destroys any notion that Uber drivers are in any way in self-employment in, in a in a sole trader business situation. So I think at the moment Uber is getting away with an, an enormous kind of myth. That they've been able to sustain that yes there's flexibility you're your own boss uh you know work when you want to fit it around your family all of this stuff implies um, a level of agency and independence when in actual fact the very the very essence of the system is one of powerlessness and of total control by uber so i mean that was one thing this kind of you don't know where you're going to be having to drive to or just drop the, the customer off at until you've accepted it. And the the other thing really is this life of being ruled by the rating system, ruled by the app, ruled by the app rating system. And again, I think Maoli's um, case that Ibrahim talked about before, you know, he's the he's the, the gold standard driver. He's a diamond driver. Something happens, he's left to speculate what's gone on with a, in an interaction with a customer. Next thing, blocked. There is, there's a complete absence of any kind of natural justice around this process. Uh, you can't find out what happened, who complained. There's no, uh, 
process to be heard, to have an explanation given. Um, so again, this, it's another expression of the, the, the powerlessness that's locked into this economic model. But I think the other part of the story is we're, we're talking all the time about the drivers naturally, but I think that as part of this conversation, let's start talking about the, the users of these apps. So Uber is phenomenal, has done an incredible job. It's done an incredible job of making itself indispensable. So at the beginning, you know, I think there was sort of genuine interest in this idea, oh, right, you know, ride sharing, asset sharing, the idea that, you know, everybody didn't have to have a car, you know, it was kind of seemed to sit nicely with climate consciousness and so on. Nobody understood at the beginning that it was a pernicious model based on a, a, a hyper precarious employment model. But in the meantime, it's ingratiated itself into the very essence of city life. I mean, you, I still, I use Ola, you know, I'd like to not. Um, but everybody's now dependent on this thing. So it's effectively become a kind of a monopolistic force in our economy and the way we move around cities. And most people who are using Uber, Ola, whoever, don't know that the driver in the car is absolutely precarious, is reliant on this piecemeal work, is subject to this gamified system, has no agency, can be blocked in the next hour without knowing uh, why, um, has nobody to ring if something goes wrong with his app, um, because there is no one, there is no human to talk to. Um, I think that the dynamic, and including the, the, the organising dynamic around this, will be helped by more public awareness of the nature of the system in the same way that I think, hmm, not that it's produced any results yet, but in the same way that I think we've all come to understand just precisely what Facebook is. Um, at the beginning, Facebook, of course, was this great benign thing. It was going to, you know, tell you where your friends' parties were or um, help you connect with your old friends from school. Who knew it was going to become a, a dark and destructive force on democracies? I think we need the same conversation about Uber. Um, so I... Um, I think I want to, I'm, I'm probably going to leave it there. The only thing I would sort of add to it is really that um, I think the court case coming up this year is very important. There's been a court case that was a very, um, based on uh, one deactivated driver in Auckland, and the decision was handed down by the Employment Court in 2020. It's a very, it's a very poor decision, um, but it's not easy to appeal these decisions. So, uh, you know, certainly I'm um, kind of waiting with bated breath for the the court action um, that is being uh, led by Etu and First Union and with um, litigants, including May Oli, um, being heard in that case. And it, you know, there's a there's a great body now of international action, legal action. Um, around the employment status of Uber drivers, and it brings that um, in a much more sort of considered and I think probably better prepared way into our court system. So I think that's going to be a very important moment. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, that's a really important point as well about, you know, um, thinking about the users of, of Uber and the public. And, you know, look, so I was thinking about uh, asking the panel about, you know, how the kind of strategies we need going forward for sort of changing that 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 narrative around Uber. And do you think that narrative is, is already changed a bit? Like people's view of Uber is getting a, a, a bit more towards that they are? No, Uber I don't company? think so, sadly, you, you know, know. Uh, which is, is a kind of, you know, <laughs> I'd like to think it was because I spent a lot of, you know, certainly in that um, long piece in North and South, mm. um, which came out just 
couple of months ago. You know, you as a journalist, you, you know, you, you want to think that you're shifting um, the public understanding, um, but it's, you know, it's a long, slow process. A bit, a bit like for Anita and Ibrahim, mm. you just like organising is a long, slow process. Um, you know, the the stories just have to keep on being told, but I mean, it's mm. very difficult because just like it's very risky for these drivers to um, to organise themselves, it's, just, it's risky for them to to speak out and you know I was lucky in in my article that I had you know a strong a strong leader in Maoli who was willing to stand up describe in detail what his um, working life was like with Uber to describe his understanding of of mm. the power relationship that he has um, with Uber and be named, and he would have, I'm sure, been photographed if he'd asked you to. Often, um, that's simply impossible. Um, as it is, I mean, I think, I suppose the other thing that I that was important for me in that story that I did in North and South is that I I wanted to be able to place um, gig work within this kind of wider panoply of systems of work that rely on hyper precarity. So. I very kind of deliberately put it sort of, you know, I guess basically I thought about the story as a, as a, as a series of economic models. And I began with labour hire, which is a, you know, a hyper, hyper precarious model, which um, a, like like gig work has enabled itself right through the economy. It has made itself indispensable. And then I looked at, um, at gig work, primarily Uber, and then I looked at, the sort of notion of the fissuring of the workforce, so the, the 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 loss of economic agency and control and and pay, the further down you go down a sort of a a, a multi layered contracting out outsourcing um, model of work, which is what you get in the likes of um, cleaning and security guards. Yeah, yeah, I like the way you put it in the historical context. And gig work hasn't come from nowhere, right? Has it? It's mm. easy to think like, oh, that this the, the app just appeared in 2013, and we everyone started doing Uber driving from nowhere. But it could only kind of become widespread because of that broader context that's going back to the neoliberal reforms of the 1990s and mm. that kind of thing. Um, but Anita and Ibrahim, if you've got any thoughts about you know like framing. The conversation going forward how how do we connect those kind of voices that are coming from the uber drivers saying how awful it is to do to work as, a, as an uber driver to the public to change that narrative who quite like using the app on their phones and find it very convenient um yeah it's it's a difficult one <laughs> Um, sort of ultimately what we're trying to do, I suppose, um, and it is a long, slow process, as Rebecca mentioned, um, but I think that what she said was very right about the fact that this company has, um, you know, very strategically sort of entered markets all over the world um, with the view of undercutting existing taxi services and then making themselves indispensable. So, um it's very difficult to try and get people to stop using um, a service that they've kind of um, come to understand as essential in some ways. Uh, and I think uh, I think the public sort of um, understanding of it is maybe shifting a little bit just in the sense that, like Rebecca talked about, at the very start, maybe there was quite a sort of um, almost Pollyanna-ish sort of view um, amongst all of us about what um, ride sharing meant, you know, that was this kind of like really lovely idea of, um, I mean, the, the word sharing to begin with, um, you know, there was sort of all this crowdsourcing going on and it feels like, you know, we're all helping each other out and um, we don't need to be so individualistic um, to get around in the world. But um, unfortunately, it hasn't played out that way and people are starting to see the reality, but I don't think they feel like they genuinely have a choice um, you know, there are a few other platforms available. They all operate in the same way. Drivers will tell you that there are like really insignificant um, differences between them, but overwhelmingly the model is the same um, and Uber is the industry leader. So as long as Uber is 
is operating this way, then the others will just follow suit and these workers won't really be able to escape this kind of exploitation that they found themselves in. Yeah, Ibrahim, did, did you want to talk about this at all? I mean, I uh, more or less agree with, with, with uh, Anita's point. I think it's a tough, um, this is a tough conversation to, to have because I think for the last four years or five years, Uber managed to uh, just make itself, it's, it's irreplaceable and, um, and the people are emotionally attached to it. And uh, if, if you see sometimes and the, the the point of peer, some people's attachment to Uber is sometimes Uber charges them about four times more than at the usual price, right? But uh, th they don't see that, and and they just so comfortable with it, and they they end up paying maybe more, like more like two wise as you know, two wise as price that they would something they they would have paid for taxi in a normal times, but they they don't see that, so that's the emotional attachment but i suppose um i think education is always the way and and often when you talk to people about the way that uber exploits people uh, and a lot of people don't understand and when you tell them the stories and they're like really we didn't know this and we thought you know they are very good to their drivers just like they're very good to us mm. um, and to me i suppose um then again um and this is the the multinational company multi-billion dollar company that uh, entrenched itself in, in the society, making itself that it's someone that cannot be replaced. But I think uh, education, um, using some sort of platform, uh, I suppose this is where the unions can, I think, um, uh, you know, jump in and play a role. Not just the two unions that who are involved in a court case, but all the unions. We are collectively, uh, mm -hmm. we are responsible for about nearly 300, 350,000 membership. Why can't we start with our members and 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 the teaching them the the exploit the exploitative behavior of of Uber and and explaining to them that uh, uh, it's not any different from but when when the employer uh, that exploits people comes when you see this kind of stories in the media everyone gets outraged everyone gets angry and when we all react and this is not any different in fact in many in a sense, it can be worse because you can't take over to the court while it's happening now. And, and you can't challenge them. You can't. There is no human to human interaction. And in many instances, it's actually worse off. And I think education could be could be the way. And, and hopefully this paper also going to contribute to that as well. So that it is tough, but it's not impossible. Yeah, great points, Ibrahim. Um, there's a couple. There's some comments from Kay Jones um, on the Facebook about about disabled passengers and and how how the technology could actually exclude some passengers as well. So we I guess we shouldn't see all kind of consumers as this kind of amorphous mass um, that are um, and there's no kind of differentiation between them. So yeah, if we end up sort of with all the taxi companies going out of business because of Uber that actually sort of makes it tough for disabled passengers yeah that can't can't use uber um so yeah good points um but yeah a gra and great point ibrahim about yeah the unions if i mean if if every kind of union member in new zealand sort of boycotted uber <laughs> that would be quite quite a lot of people wouldn't it and that would have some that would have a great impact 350,000 and uh, and others will follow if we if, if we we as a unionist can take a lead on this. Mm. Yeah, Mohan, did you want to do do any kind of summing up, wrapping up? Because we're we're running out of time a little bit, aren't we? We're uh, over the hour and thirty minutes. Nami Leon, I just wanted to thank you, Anita. Thank you, um, Ibrahim, and thank you, Rebecca, for your um, really important work in getting these narratives and voices out. If there is one thing that we see throughout our field work is the erasure of the voice, and you touch upon this idea of power, the tremendous power inequality that shapes the communicative infrastructure, if you will. Uh, so, you know, within that context, listening to these voices and listening to these stories, 
perhaps um, open uh, spaces for pedagogy, not only uh, for workers, as you point out, all three of you, but also for um, a broader uh, public opinion, shaping uh, that public opinion. I also uh, really enjoyed the point that you made, um, Ibrahim, about uh, taxes, you know, this idea that um, um, Uber uh, doesn't pay uh, taxes here. That's a really important point in terms of um, the collective responsibility and the kinds of infrastructures that are necessary policy-wise in terms of ho holding these global uh, platform capital to account. And, um, you know, Rebecca, when you talked about Facebook, it's the same model in the sense that Facebook doesn't pay taxes in Aotearoa. So I think that's a broader conversation to be had in terms of how you hold to account uh, global um, uh, corporations, you know, which seems like sort of the frontiers of extreme capitalism uh, that um, operate across countries, do not pay taxes, and do not in most instances um, respond to the regulatory climates within those um, uh, countries. You know? So I want to wrap up there and perhaps uh, go to each one of you uh, to say maybe just something uh, to wrap up the conversation. I can start. Uh, look, I, I um, again, um, thank you. I think, I think um, uh, th this, this is a very important conversation. We should not downplay that the, the, the role this paper and this conversation is gonna, gonna have um, in, 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 in when we discuss this issue as we move forward. Right? And I think that is the question, the very important question is that this is gonna be just a one-off initiative and that then it's going to be a business as usual, but, or it's going to be um, there is going to be a, a follow up and, and and more work to do because I think um, we're talking about the people that don't have a voice, and the more they see this, the more they hear from us. I think the confidence is going to grow, and and many of them will be um, comfortable on their skin to join the unions and to organize themselves. Um, but this this conversation is, is very important as well at the court case that both unions are, are uh, championing. So um, thank you for uh, taking interest on this, spending a lot of time and energy. I'm sure um, a lot of work went into this. Um, thank you for, for doing this because it, to me, it, it really is emotional. It really is personal because I do talk to a lot of people that who are stuck in this job. And for about for many years, that these people don't have any annual leave, so they, as a result, they can't even go back to see their dying family members or to see their parents, even in many cases, even to see their kids as well. So this is a really very important piece of piece of work. So thank you, and I also want to acknowledge my two um, uh, uh, co-panelists, um, Anita and Rebecca, for their contribution. Nami here. Now, Mihi, Anita, do you want to do a summing up um, final point? Sure, thanks, Leon. Um, I guess I just wanted to to acknowledge the fact that um, we're at the start of a really, really big fight um, and that we shouldn't underestimate the lengths that Uber will go to to control the narrative around this. Um, so it's sort of our collective responsibility, I guess, to as people who care about this and care about the workers at the heart of it, to counter that narrative as much as we possibly can. Um, and so it's it's really fantastic that, um, you know, work, that this re research is happening and that it, it's leading to um, the education of people around the reality of this work, um, giving them the, the sort of the tools and the talking po points they'll need to do that. Um, and I just wanted to also um, sort of steal um, Ibrahim's point which I thought he made much more clearly than I made, um, which I, sh I should have done, which is that the, the way out of this is for these workers to organise. That's really clear. That's the only way out of this. Um, and so that's where the focus will be in the coming years. And the support of the general public around them will be um, key to their success. So I'm really looking forward to sort of seeing uh, the community of Aotearoa um, rallying around these workers so that they can achieve something better for themselves. Great, yeah, fingers crossed, eh? Um, Rebecca, some final points? Um, yeah, just super, really briefly, I guess, um, 
you know, nothing good ever happened without organising, as I suppose is something that I've um, learned in the last few years in the work I've been doing. I, I, I'll, perhaps I'll just finish with one little anecdote, which um, I think helped me a lot when I was working on on my story and thinking about, um, particularly in the current tight labour market, supposedly um, of 3.2% unemployment and the notion of choice existing for workers in this current economy. And I remember saying to Mao Oli when I was interviewing him, well, you know, there's plenty of other options out there. There are lots of jobs. Employers are screaming out for them. Why don't you just leave? And his answer to me, and I think this is important because that will be one of the um, sort of reflexive responses to your research and to the stories of how spectacularly one-sided Uber is. Um in terms of its level of control over over these workers. But Mayor Oli's answer was, well, you know, I like to do this. I am providing an incredibly important service. I take people to where they want to go to. I take people to their hospital. I I talk to them. I none of none of the fact that there's you know a tight labor market takes away from the fact that I'm entitled in my work to be treated uh, equitably and paid a decent sum of money for my time. So I think that, I guess, anticipating the kind of pushback that will come as this narrative builds, as the story becomes more and more widely known, that, oh, you know, people workers have got a choice, they can just do something else, that is not an answer. And I think I really liked Maoli's answer was because his, his response was one of, well, this work has dignity. As a worker who does this work, I have dignity and I'm entitled to be treated with dignity and this company does not do that. Great, great points. Yeah, great, great point to end on. Okay, should we leave it there? Thank you very much, all, th all, all three panelists. And thank you to the audience um, that tuned in on Facebook Live. And hopefully that's not the end of the conversation. As Anita said, this is just the start. Hey, just keep keep fighting the fight and keep challenging that that kind of ideology that Uber is sort of good for society and creates this kind of new jobs and creates choice and economic growth. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, See you soon. Thank you.